Our speaker this morning, his biography and experience is so large and broad that I'm going to simply skim through a couple of notes very briefly. He started out in suburban Philadelphia, born to uh, uh, a father who was a very, very active and uh, actually turned out to be famous uh, evangelical type or Christian uh, speaker. And uh, in fact, his father, Tony uh, Campolo, was the, one of the most important evangelical Christian speak, uh, preachers in the last several years. Uh, he became a spiritual advisor to Bill Clinton. Okay, I didn't know that, but it's nice to find out. The younger Campolo, whom we we're fortunate to have here this morning, had developed a reputation of his own running successful inner city missions in Philadelphia and Ohio. He did this for over 20 years. And during those three decades of Christian ministry, Bart Campolo became increasingly committed to cultivating loving relationships, working for social justice, and appreciating the wonders of life in general. Uh, speaking of wonders of life, he was out on his bicycle one day and uh, happened to have a fairly, uh, what should I say, uh, deeply involved accident. He cracked his helmet pretty well. His odometer on the bi on his his personal odometer registered 40 miles per hour, and of course he doesn't remember much of that. It cracked his helmet pretty severely. I don't know what it did to his head, but uh, it. <laughs> There's no evidence of damage in that regard. Uh, anyhow, he now is a counselor and community builder, volunteer humanist chaplain at uh, University of Southern California. Uh, he has a weekly podcast, Humanize Me, Humanize Me. And uh, that podcast is an increasingly popular resource for secularists around the world who want to make the most of their lives. He brought a few books along with him, which uh, I don't know if you'll be able to, there are so few that I don't know if you'll be able to find them or not, but anyhow, check back on the table, the author's signing table, if you're interested. But it is my great pleasure to introduce young Bartolo, <laughs> Bar Bart Campolo. So, I'm really glad to be with you. I am. I'm the, I'm the humanist chaplain at the University of Southern California. And that is a, a fun place to be a chaplain. Um, and what it means is that I spend almost all of my time working with young people who want to make the world a better place, who want to build great relationships, who want to cultivate a sense of wonder and gratitude for the privilege of being alive, and, and, and who don't believe in God. Um, and, and, it's, and so I work out of the Office of Religious Life at the university. I'm considered a religious leader there. Um, because it, at, at University of Southern California, they don't define religion in terms of believing in supernatural realities. They define it as being consumed with answering life's ultimate questions. Where do we come from? What happens when we die? What makes something right? What makes something wrong? How do you make the most of this life? And I love that definition. Religion as the pursuit of life's ultimate questions, which makes me a religious leader. So I'm so glad to be with you religious people on Sunday morning. <laughs> no, I really am glad to be with you. And you know, Jerry, who isn't here, when he invited me to come, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? You know, sometimes people are like, you know, they want you to tell your story. But I, I would imagine you guys get lots of people in here who tell you the same story over and over again. I used to believe in God, and now I don't. It doesn't make sense. And I, and I said, I don't really want to tell that story. I could tell it. Am I messing you up, man? No, we're good? I said, I don't really want to tell that story. What do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, he said, if you, I think for our audience, you should talk about death. Now, I didn't understand what he meant by that until I walked in the room this morning. And then all of a sudden, I understood the relevance of his topic. In truth, what he wanted me to talk about was life. And I want to just take a few moments and talk about a secular approach to life. When I was a little boy, my older cousin Raymond, 
was my hero. Raymond was this, he, he was kind, I, I don't know if you've ever met somebody like that who you would say is just full of life, you know? He, I mean, he was just, he was fun. I remember a friend of mine, um, when Raymond was in college, I, I said something to him about Ray, and he said, he said, wherever Raymond goes, it's a party. What a great thing to say about somebody. Wherever they go, it's a party. And Raymond was funny, and he was smart, and he was energetic, and he was engaged with all sorts of people. And he was like that when I was a little kid, and he used to take me all around. And then he went to college, and he was kind of a campus leader, president of the student body, that kind of guy. And then he went into the Baptist ministry, and he was that kind of energized young pastor who whipped people into shape and ran summer camps for little kids and all that kind of... He was just that way all the way through his life until he was about 42 years old. And when he was about 42 years old, Raymond had a serious, devastating stroke. And uh, I got the call to come down to the hospital. And my Aunt Ann, his mother, was there. And we were close. And we went into the room, and Raymond was hooked up to all these machines, and he was, the doctors told us, he was brain dead. There was nothing they could do for him. They had him on a ventilator. They were keeping his body alive, the doctor told me, long enough that his mother could process the grief in the hopes that she would then sign his organs over for organ donation because he was a young, healthy, otherwise healthy guy. So I spent the next day or two sitting with her, talking with her, finally getting to the place where we made the decision that we would donate Raymond's organs. And, and I remember when we told the doctors, and they came in and they disconnected the equipment. And we sat there waiting for Raymond to breathe his last. Here was this guy who had been so full of life, who had taken me so many places, who had done so much with me. And I remember sitting next to him with his mother holding her hand and desperately wishing and wanting and hoping that heaven was true. I just, I wanted to believe that I would see, somehow, somewhere, I would see him again. And she wanted to believe the same thing. And I remember her saying to me, we'll see him again, won't you? And me saying back, I hope so, I hope so. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where, where you really wanted it to be true. I know here you celebrate that it's not true, but if you, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you wanted it to be true, but in that moment, I wanted for heaven to be real. And, and, and you know, in that, I'm not alone. And if you've ever felt that way, you're not alone. Robert Ingersoll, who's my sort of, you know, humanist hero, the great Robert Ingersoll, I don't know if you guys are aware of him, he was, he was the world's most popular orator in the 1890s. He was a wonderful, wonderful free thinker. And Ingersoll wrote this. Here was his quote. He said, The idea of immortality, like, that like a sea has ebbed and flowed in the human heart, with its countless waves of hope and fear, beating against the shores and rocks of time and fate, was not born of any book, nor of any creed, nor of any religion. It was born of human affection, and it will continue to ebb and flow beneath the mists and clouds of doubt and darkness for as long as love kisses the lips of death. It is the rainbow, hope, shining on the tears of grief. See, what Ingersoll was trying to say was that hoping for heaven Religion didn't make that up. It's just the other way around. It was the hope of heaven that caused people to invent religions. That what, what caused people, the hope of heaven comes when you love somebody and they leave and they're gone and you want to see them again. And then he says, as long as people love each other, at the end of their lives they'll be hoping, just maybe, there's something beyond. It's natural. We're here in a hospital. And I'm a friends with a lot of hospital chaplains. And I'll tell you, the one thing I'll tell you for true is that even people that have never really thought much about heaven and hell in their whole lives, a lot of times when they're here, they start thinking about it, start hoping for it, start wishing for it. And you know what? In my, in my early secular days, when I first came out of Christianity, 
I wanted to argue with people like that. I wanted to explain to them why it didn't make any sense. I wanted to show them the scientific evidence. And I wanted to talk to them about how the brain is, you know, our identities are in our brains and when our brains break down. But the older I get, the less I want to argue with anybody. the less sense it makes to me because if there's anything this brain has come to understand, it is the hope of heaven is natural. It's natural. It's, it, it comes naturally to us. Still Ingersoll goes on in this, in this little quote. He says, it may be natural, but it's a problem. And then he says this. He said, wanting eternal life may be only natural, but he says, there, are, there is one thing of which I am certain, and that is that if we could live forever here, if it were true, if we could live forever, we would care nothing for each other. The fact that we must die, the fact that the feast must end, brings our souls together and treads the weeds from out between the paths between our hearts. See what he says, and what you'll discover if you spend much time in this hospital outside of this auditorium, is that death, the reality of death, the fear of death, the consciousness of death, creates a deep sense of urgency. What Ingersoll was saying is, is that if we were going to live forever, we would have no reason to connect with each other or to reconnect with each other. It is the deadline, it is the fear of death that makes us do it. And if you've ever sat at the bedside of somebody who's dying, you know what that's like. People come into the room and they do business with a dying person. Grudges get worked out. People say, you know, I should have said this to you a long time ago, but I've always loved you. I forgive you for that. Gee, remember that time it was so wonderful? You know what I've never told you is how much I appreciated this or that or the other thing. When people, when people sense time is running short, they do business with each other, don't they? And what Ingersoll was saying is, is, is that if, if there was no sense of urgency, if there was no time running short, he said, we might not care about each other. There'd be no urgency. You know what, I, I could get to know you, but I'll get to know you tomorrow, or next year, or a hundred years from now, or a thousand years from now. That eternity would take, out the, to, would take away from us the urgency to connect that makes us human. The urgency to connect. Eternity, on some level, isn't a comfort, it's the enemy. Love, if you will, requires a deadline. That, that, that was what, what Ingersoll was trying to suggest was, and, and that's been my experience too, is that, is that where there is no urgency, a lot of times people get lazy with each other. But that as time gets short, as people understand, this is my one life, how do I make the most of it? All of a sudden there's a fierce urgency to connect. Eternity distracts people from the now. So as a, as a humanist chaplain on a college campus, a big part of my life is to get a bunch of young people together and on a regular basis tell them, you're going to die. Because <laughs> young people don't think about death. They don't think about it enough. You know, I have, I, 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 When I work with little kids, I have a little talk I give to the little kids called the ABCs of death. I say, little kids, repeat after me. Point A, all human beings die. And they go, all oh, human beings die. And I say, point B, I am a human being. And they go, I am a human being. I say, repeat after me, point C, I am going to die. And they go, I am going to die. And you say, would you mind singing that for me? And they go, no problem. I'm going to die. I'm, you, with little kids, you can get them to do it. And the reason you can goof around with little kids about death is what? It's not real. It's just an idea. But my job is to try to get them to actually embrace the finitude of life. To say to them not only, that death is not something to fear, but something to be grateful for. Because without death, there would be no love. And without love, eternal life would be eternal misery. Embracing finitude, embracing death, you say, I guess I see the logic of it, but, but really? And what I would say to you is, is not only is embracing death good, make good sense, it also is good science. 
it's really good science. Because the fact of the matter is, is that, and, and you know, we're a free thought thing. So I know you guys are all about science, and so you're probably aware of the fact that life is a relatively recent invention in the universe, right? The universe is about 13.77 billion years old, but there hasn't been, life, life as we know, it hasn't been around for nearly that long, right? Does anybody know how long life has been around on this planet? Yeah, about 3 billion years, right? So for 10 billion years, there was no such thing. Life is actually fairly common. But what you may not know is, is that just as life is a, is a recent development on some level, on a cosmic scale, death is an even more recent development. I mean, because the fact of the matter is, life existed for a long time before there was death. So what are you talking about? As soon as there's life, there's this. It's not true. The earliest living organisms were single-celled organisms, right? And do you know how single-celled organisms reproduce? Asexually. Asexually. Yeah, a single-celled organism, what happens is, is that it splits into what? Into two cells. Neither one of which what? Dies, no. As long as there's energy and food enough around, they just keep re reproducing. And single-celled organisms can reproduce endlessly without any of them having to die. But then, as life proceeded, at some point, you started to get... What, what happened was, and, and, and it's funny, there's a great podcast on Radiolab about the, the, the whole hour and a half devoted to the moment when the first two single-celled organisms somehow combined into one multi-celled organism. But you guys know your Darwin, right? You guys know that at some point, what, the single-celled organisms become more complex. And you get multi-celled organisms. And, and, and then you get more and more complex organisms. And when multi-celled organisms em emerge, what happens is, is that the, the different cells start to, start to perform what? Different functions. They specialize, exactly. And so what happens is, is that there become two main kinds of cells that all of us have, all multiple-celled organisms have. There are germ cells, which are charged with the reproductive qualities. And then there's what they call the som somatic cells, the soma. And that's everything else. And basically what happens is, is that you've got one set of cells in your body that's devoted to re reproducing, that, that, that sort of takes care of your immortality by, by passing on your genes. So your body isn't, isn't immortal, but your genes keep going. And the, you, you know this, right? The genes, just, they, the genes have this deep desire to keep going, keep moving forward, keep propagating, and, and it uses the rest of you, right? The rest of your body, everything else about you, on, on a biological level, only exists for one purpose. What? To keep, keep the DNA moving. That's right, to keep moving along. Now, here's the funny thing, is that there are all different strategies biologically that we have for moving forward. You have legs, and they carry you around, and they keep you away from danger to keep those genes alive. And you have hands that grasp for food and, and put in, you have a digestive system that provides energy, and all of it to keep the genes alive long enough to what? to reproduce. And you and I have a really wonderful set of somatic cells called our brains. And our brains control the operation, move us around, make all sorts of judgments, all of which from a biological level are for this purpose. The, bi the great biologist Ursula Goodenough, she wrote it this way. She said, now here's the interesting thing. She said, so our brains, and hence our minds, are destined to die with the rest of the soma. I mean, the soma, the, the, the reproductive things go on, but the soma dies, but it says, it says that, 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 that liberates the soma. The, 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 the somatic cell process, cell death, somatic cell death gets programmed in, and immortality gets ho handed over to the gene line so that the whole thing can be more efficient. So our brains and hence our minds are destined to die with the rest of the soma. And here it is that we arrive at one of the central ironies of human existence. 
which is that our sentient brains are uniquely capable of experiencing re deep regret and sorrow and fear at the prospect of death. And yet it was the invention of death, the invention of the germ soma dichotomy that makes possible the existence of our brains. And so it is that it's death that makes it possible for us to develop consciousness so that we can be afraid of death. Isn't that interesting? That in a real sense, what she's trying to get across is, is that death is the price of consciousness. If you, you, you can have one, it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a choice. Do you want immortality? Or do you want consciousness? Because you can't have both. Death is the price of consciousness. And, and so, so you say, well, what is that good science? How does that translate into good life? And the answer is, is that if you've been blessed, if you will, with consciousness, the wisest and most sensible, the most rational, the most scientific response to that would be gratitude. Lucky you, you get to die. Lucky you, because if you didn't get to die, you wouldn't get to be conscious of life. Every good thing that we, we, that we miss, every good thing that we worry about letting go of, everything that we will ever regret losing is made possible by the death that creates the consciousness that may, helps us to enjoy it. Does it. Am I making sense to you? It's an important thing. Richard Dawkins, you know, who I know a lot of you are right. Richard Dawkins, I think, says it very well. He says, look, if it, do, do, I don't know why you complain so much about death. He says, don't you realize that you've, just by virtue of being here, that you have won the cosmic lottery? That out of all the energy and all the matter in the universe, you could have been a cockroach. You could have been a rock on Jupiter. You could have been an island of gas out there in the middle, in the middle of, the, uh, of space. But instead, you are this weird collection of matter and energy that has achieved consciousness. He said, even among living things, you're lucky. He said, e even, even just among your own family, you're lucky. When you think about it. I mean, when you were conceived, there were billions of... of Sperm cells racing for that egg, and you won. <laughs> You're a billion to one shot just to be here. And he says that when you have won such an amazing privilege, it is unseemly to be ungrateful that you don't get an eternal supply of it. I mean, think about it. Imagine if you won the lottery and you won $10 billion and they came to interview you and said, how do you feel? And you say, I can't believe it wasn't $25 billion. <laughs> People would say, what's the matter with you? Instead of complaining about what you didn't win, you should do what? Live it up with what you did. That's right. And that, my friends, is my encouragement to you. People might look at, it, at, a, at an aging bunch of atheists like yourselves. And they might say, boy, you should feel bad. You don't have much time left. And what I would say is, you should feel lucky. You've got some time left. You, 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 I mean, you have won the cosmic lottery. I mean, gratitude makes sense. Now listen, I, a couple years ago, a friend of mine, really rich friend of mine, um, knew that my family and I, we spent most of our lives working with poor people in the inner city. We, don't, we, we hadn't amassed a great fortune. And so he said, you know what? He said, I'm rich, and you're not. He said, I got this mansion down in uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina. He said, how about if I give it to you for two weeks and you, you take your family on a vacation to Hilton Head? I said, that would be great. We haven't been on vacation like that ever. So, so we did. We loaded up and we, and we drove down to Hilton Head, South Carolina. And when we got there, it was this amazing mansion. And, on, and, on the, and you know how you come in and they leave a little note for you on the, on the counter? And on the note, he had also left keys to the wine cellar and to his convertible Jaguar said, have a good time. <laughs> and boy, we had a good time. We, I mean, we swam in the pool. We went to the beach. We did all this stuff. And you know, as the vacation went on, I was having such a good day. It's amazing how easily you can get used to a mansion. I mean, by, you know, at first I was like, oh, wow, this is incredible. After about three days, I was like, you know what? 
I don't know. The, uh, the pool doesn't seem to be right temperature right now. We, we, we better get somebody in here to look at that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got you. I, you could get used to living that way easy. In fact, with about five days to go, four days to go on the vacation, I started to get upset. Have you ever had that experience? You see the end coming? And I was like, we're going to have to go back to that crappy house of ours. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back to work. I, I, just started to get, I started to get grumpy because the vacation was going to be over. And my daughter pulled me aside and she said, Dad, you're an idiot. <laughs> she said, you've got four more days here and you're going to waste it whining over the fact that we don't get to live here forever? She said, man, you should just live it up. And boy, she was right. I mean, that's the smart thing to do. If you only have four days and you're left in your vacation, go to the beach. Eat the food, drink the wine, live it up, enjoy it. And then on the last day, she said, you know what we should do? We should clean the place up. And we should buy some flowers. And we should leave a note for the next family that's going to stay here, telling them we hope they have as good a time as we did. Ah, oh, that's the way to live, isn't it? So what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that's a metaphor for our lives. It's running out. You should live it up. And part of the way that you live it up is, is she, 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 when I said to her, what about that cleaning up thing? That seems like a waste of time. She says, no, no, no. She said, as we clean up and fix it up for them, we'll imagine all the fun they're going to have. And imagining the fun that they're going to have will make us happy. Vicarious joy, she was talking about. You know, you know, you know how people always criticize her. We're tr you're trying to live vicariously through your children, as if, as if vicarious enjoyment is a bad thing. Boy, the older I get, the more I think it's a good thing. When you think about it, right? I mean, more and more of my fun I get through other people. Have you ever been to a really good movie? You ever go to a really good movie? I, 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 you know, the, the first day it came out, my family and I went to the first Star Wars movie. I don't know if any, do, do, there must be some geeky, geeky atheists in here, right? Right, right you like the, any science fiction people in here? Do you remember Star Wars? Do you remember the, when it first came out? No one had ever seen any movie like that. And we went to it the first night, and I still remember, because it was, it was a late night showing, and then you're coming out, and there are people lined up for the next show. And you're walking out of this movie, and they're lined up, and they look at you like, and you're nodding at them going, oh, you're in for a great show. Have you ever had, it's fun, isn't it? There's a bond. As you're walking out and you see them walking in, you go, hey, man, you are in for a good thing. You know what? That's how I feel more and more about my life. I look at these young people at the college, and I think to myself, listen, my day is almost, my, my day has passed a little bit, but you're still, you haven't yet fallen in love. I loved falling in love. You're going to fall in love. I, I love, right, right, you got married, right? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. yeah. They, they didn't let you do that earlier, did they? <laughs> no, no, they, 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 it, wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing to do. But do you ever look at the young lesbians and you just think, oh, you got so much, it's going to be so great. You look at younger people and you think, you've got, you're going to have kids. Some of you have our parents and, you know, you see people that are going to have kids and you think, man, I had so much fun with my little kids. But my ankles are shot. I mean, I can stand up here and talk to you, but I, I used to play soccer and basketball and frisbee. I used to run around, but I, there's no cartilage left in either of my ankles. Every moment I'm standing up here, I'm in pain in my ankles. I feel them every minute of the day. They've been operated on four different times. They're ruined. But last night before I went to bed, I looked at the NBA. They were playing the All-Star game. These young guys are jumping and leaping. And you say, oh, I bet that made you bitter. Oh, not if you're smart. If you're smart, you watch them and you think, lucky you. Enjoy those legs. What a beautiful thing it is. And you take vicarious pleasure in watching them do it. You know, if you told me right now, Bart, I'm going to kill you five years early, but in exchange for five years of your life, some young kid is going to get born 150 years from now that you'll never meet. And he's going to grow up and he's going to eat good food and he's going to run and jump and play and then fall in love and have kids and get married and get old and die. If you die, if you, if, we, if you give five years now, that kid will have a chance to live. And if you don't, he'll never be born. I would do it in a heartbeat. 
He said, wait a second, you don't believe in eternity? You're never going to see him, you're never going to meet him? What good does that do you? And the answer is, the, just the imagining it, of it would give me so much pleasure right now, it would be worth it. And that's what Ingersoll was talking about. Ingersoll was saying, listen, listen. The key to, the key to living well, the key to dying well, is training ourselves to not only care about ourselves, but to take pleasure not just in our own lives, but in the lives of other people and in the future of our species. Is, is to respond in gratitude and say, listen, I've been given an incredible bounty by nobody, right? It's a gift from nowhere. I'm lucky. Can't you be grateful to be lucky? <coughs> Actually, medical science, every psychologist I've ever talked to would say, that it's not that happy people are grateful. It turns out what? Grateful people are happy. There's all sorts of psychology that says that the act of being thankful for whatever it is that you have actually causes you to enjoy that more and releases all sorts of chemicals in your brain that, that increase your enjoyment of life. And so what I'm saying to you is, is that if you want to die well, you've got to learn to not only enjoy your own life, but to vicariously enjoy the lives of other people, and especially younger people. Of course, for some of us, the problem isn't that we don't know how to live or we don't know how to die. The problem is we don't know how to handle it when other people die. We have a really hard time grieving, don't we? Yeah, it's hard. And some of us have a hard time grieving. We have a really hard time comforting people who are grieving. When I was a Christian minister, you know, it was easy. It was much easier in my Christian days, or at least so I thought it was. Because you know what you say to somebody after, when, they're, when somebody dies in the Christian world? You say what? See them in, in heaven. No problem. They're in a better place. It's all good. We all live forever. Nobody really dies. You know, it's funny. You would think that was, you know, my secular friends say, man, you had it easy when you were a Christian. That, that heaven stuff's a real good, uh, real good gimmick. You know what? When you're standing with the parent of an 18-year-old kid who's been killed in a car accident, it ain't much good. Because the price of heaven is that you have to convince them that there's a good and loving God who, for a very good reason, destroyed their child. Man. There's a, there's a dark side to everything. You say, well, so... So... What do you say? I don't know how many funerals you guys have been to. I've been to a lot of funerals. I worked in the inner city for 20 years, so I went to a lot of funerals of a lot of young people. I went to a lot of funerals of a lot of old people. And I learned that there's a difference between a good funeral and a bad funeral. I don't know if you've ever been to a good funeral. But at a good funeral, what happens is, is that everybody gets together, and we're sad. We miss the person who's gone. We're sad. But at a good funeral, people tell stories to each other. And the stories that they tell are of the moments when that person was most fully alive, when they connected with this person, when they helped that person, when they did. They never talk about how much money they made. They never talk about how much stuff they bought. They never really talk about their accomplishments. They always talk about their relationships. They always talk about their experiences. I had a friend whose father died a couple of years ago. I went to the funeral, and for three hours, people got up and told stories about this guy. He was a wonderful man. I had known him as a little boy. He helped raise me, helped raise all of my friends. And after the funeral was over, you know, everyone was exhausted. We'd been there for hours telling stories. And I went to the, the son, and I said, man, I know you guys are grieving. I'm sorry that everybody made you stay here so long. We just couldn't let it go. And he looked at me and said, oh, he said, Bart. He said, we could have sat there for five days listening to that stuff. We heard stories about our dad today that we had never heard before. It was like we got, we got parts of him that we had never gotten. That's that, we, they were, we were celebrating the way he lived. And, and, what, and what he said to me was, and I, and I wrote this down. He said, he said a funeral like this doesn't, doesn't make me sad as much as it inspires me to want to live my life in such a way that when I die, there are good stories to be told about me. Doesn't that make sense? And so he said to me, he said, 
Comfort is hard to give to people when they're grieving. Comfort can be hard to give for people who are grieving. But, but in some sense, when somebody's grieving, it's the ultimate test of our worldview. I mean, we all, we all put up the slides and we say, the secular rational worldview, science and reason, that's, that's the most superior worldview, right? Like, or the old facts back us up. We have the most superior worldview. You know what? The most superior worldview is not the one that is the most correct. The most superior worldview is the one that makes your life better. And I think we've got the best one on that score, too, if we say it right. A couple of years ago, a parent wrote to me and said, my two-year my, 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 my two marriage is on the rocks right now because we just had a baby, and the baby la lived for four days in the hospital on a ventilator, and then the baby died. And we, do not, we are secular people. We do not believe in any supernaturalism, and we don't know what to do. What comfort can you offer us? And I said, I can't comfort you with heaven or any promises of eternal life, but I can comfort you with a little bit of perspective. What I want to ask you is this. What I want to ask you is, as painful as this is, what I want to suggest to you is, is that your grief is a reflection of how much you loved that child. You love that child, and what I'm going to tell you is, is that on, on, a, on a scientific level, on a neuroscience level, the question is, do you think that child sensed your love? I'm not talking about consciously understood it. I'm saying, do you, did, did she sense it? When, when she was at the breast, would she, would she have felt that love, would, the warmth? Did, did the child have any sensory experience of your love? Because I believe that, that it did. And I said, I don't want to in any way minimize this tragedy. This is an unmitigated tragedy. That child should have had so much more. But what I'm going to tell you is, is that at the end of our lives, most of us would give everything we have and everything we own for just four more days of life. And so whether it's at the beginning or at the end, it is the finitude of life. It is the, 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 the limited nature of life that makes it infinitely precious. And your, your child's four days were infinitely precious. And I, said, and I said to them, I said, the question you have to ask yourself is, if you had it to do over again and you knew your child was only going to live four days, do you wish that you had never had her? And they said, oh, no. No, even those four days, like, like, as painful as it is, we loved her. And I said, yeah. And she got to sense your love. Tennyson was right. It is better to have loved and lost than what? Never to have loved at all. I said, that's, 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 we always want more. But we have, if there's anything that the secular life needs to teach us, it's how to be joyful with enough. How to, embrace, not, how to embrace our own finitude. The fact that we are limited is what makes us connect with each other. And, and, and the fact that we die is what enables us to live and be conscious. And so there, it's a, I'm not saying that death isn't hard. I'm just saying it's part of the bargain, and it's a good bargain. That's all I'm saying is it's a good bargain. That finitude is a part of our human identities. Now, when I was working in the inner city, some of the, 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 the bad funerals were the ones where the person had lived in pain and suffering, where they had crappy parents, and they had been abused and beaten, and then they died young, and they never got to experience very much. That's a, and you say, well, how do you, make, how, do you, how do you make sense of that? And the answer is, I don't make sense of that. See, what I'm telling you is, the universe doesn't care. The wonder of it is that it has created sentient human beings like you and me, and you care, and I care, and we create meaning by caring for each other, but the universe itself has no meaning. The universe doesn't care, and so what that means is that in this universe that doesn't care, there is no justice except that which we make. Ultimately, death and injustice place a heavy burden on you and me. Because the, the only response I have to 
a young person dying without being loved is to look up the road and say, are there any other young people out there that aren't being loved? Can we get to them before they die? He said, but what about that? I can't do anything. That kid is dead and gone. The only thing I can do about past injustice is try to address future problems and make things better for other people. Ultimately, that's why I work at a university campus, because I want to turn kids on to the reality of death while they're still young so that they can use their lives and their careers and their relationships to make things better for other people. Because that is what will ultimately, at the end of their lives, when they are dying, that is what will, that is what will, that's how you measure meaning. That's how they'll know if it was a good life. I'll tell you one story and then I'll, I'll, I'll be done. And if you've got questions, we can talk about them. And if you want to answer that phone, it's okay with me. <laughs> my dad, he, he, you mentioned my dad, and he, is, he, is, he was and is a big-time evangelical Christian minister. It's interesting, though. He's also the biggest supporter of my humanist ministry. Yeah, yeah. He, he, and, I, he and actually, the book that I've got is a book that I wrote with him called Why I Left, Why I Stayed. It's a conversation that we had with one another about... But, about, about why I left and why he stays, but really about how a Christian and a non-Christian can have a meaningful relationship with each other and where, and where they can find, if not common ground, at least common respect and love for one another. My dad, when we were writing this book, he, he was questioning about death, and, then he t and he told me a story that stuck with me. He said when, when he was in college, he was away at college um, just outside of Philadelphia where he grew up, and he got a phone call from his mother at the dorm. And when he answered the phone, his mother said, Tony, Mrs. Kilpatrick has died. Mrs. Kilpatrick was his Sunday school teacher when he was a little kid. She was good to him. He said, Mrs. Kilpatrick has died, he said. And he said, my mother said, Mrs. Kilpatrick died. She said, and the least you can do is go to the funeral. <laughs> and my father said, when my mother said, the least you can do is go to the funeral, that meant what? You better get yourself to that funeral. So he said he, he got the directions. He got the, he got the, he got the stuff together. And, and a couple of days later, he jumped in the car and he drove. Now, this was, this was a long time ago. This was before there were GPSs and cell phones and stuff like that. And, and I don't know. If, I, no, no, my kids don't know what this is like, but he got lost. <laughs> anybody, anybody out there know what, you know what I'm talking about? Remember getting lost? And there was no phone to call? And you could, right, remember that? He said, I got lost, and he said, I, as the time went on, I realized I was getting up and up and up, and he said, I'm frantically going around. He said, finally, I, I pulled up, I finally figured it out. I pulled up in front of the funeral home. He said, I parked my car, I jumped out of the car, I grabbed my Bible, because, you know, he was that guy, and he said, I ran into the funeral home. And he said, I, 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 went, I marched right in the room, I went in, I sat down, and he said, I did what you're supposed to do at a funeral when you first sit down, you know, put my head down, you know pretending to pray, and he said, I looked up, and the room was empty. <laughs> Except there was the casket, and he said, there was one woman sitting on the other side of the casket, just one person there. He said, this was confusing to him. Mrs. Kilpatrick was a wonderful woman. He said, he said, and so, he said so I, I, I stood up, and I, I looked over the edge of the casket, and he said, that man did not look like Mrs. Kilpatrick. <laughs> he said, I was at the wrong, he said, I was in the wrong funeral. And he said, I got up to leave. And as I was leaving, he said, the woman on the other side crossed over to me. And he said, as I was walking by her, she grabbed my wrist. And she looked at me and she said, you were a friend of his, weren't you? You knew my husband. You were his friend, right? And my dad said, I did what any good Christian would do in that situation. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> he said, I said, yes, I was, and I sat down. <laughs> he, said, Some, he said to me, he said, Bart, he said, there come times in a man's life when a man must not only lie, but he must lie with vigor and imagination. <laughs> so I sat down. Nobody else came. We sat there. The minister came in, did a little thing. Then they closed the casket, and they loaded it up in the hearse to go out to the cemetery. He said, I didn't know what else to do, so I climbed into the, ca I climbed into the, 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 the hearse alongside the, the widow, and we drove out there. She held my hand the whole way. 
We got out to the funeral. They put him in. She threw fl her flower. I threw mine. They put dirt over the casket. And we drove back to the funeral home. So by the time we got to the funeral home, he said, he said I was feeling overcome with guilt. I just, it just didn't seem right. And so he said, when we got there, he said, I, I said, I said to her, he said, Mrs. Wilson, I have to be honest with you. I didn't really know your husband. I want to be friends with you from now on, and I, I can't have our friendship be based on a lie, so I have to tell you, I, I didn't know him. She said she held his hands really tight, and she looked up at him and she said, young man, you'll never, ever know what you're being with me today meant to me. You'll never know what it, what it meant to me to be with you. My friends, that's what I'm saying, is that you know how we help each other, how we comfort each other in death? We have to come close to each other. We have to be with each other. You have... There is, no, there, there is no supernatural force in the universe, and yet you have miraculous powers. The power you have is to enter into somebody else's solitude, to enter into their fear, to enter into their uncertainty, to enter into their grief, and to be with them. You, you say to me, I'm retired. I'll tell you, I've got a job for you. Because I know a lot of people, young and old, who are alone in the world. And who are sad and who are struggling. And I look at you, and you're such nice people. And you're out here on a Sunday morning, which means that you're, you're, you still care about life, and you're still thinking, and you're still engaged with all this stuff, and you've got friendships. And I want to tell you something. The friendships that you've got in this room, I'm out there in the world, and I meet people all the time that don't have anything like this. Hey, dude with the, who's putting the stuff on the videos, good for you, my friend. Because I'll tell you what, I get emails from people every day who are listening to my podcast. People that I meet, people that read about me in some newspaper article, and they go, a secular person who's building a fellowship of people that care about each other? I never heard of such a thing. Where can I join? I don't know if you know that you're sitting on top of pure gold here. Not because you're so smart. Not because you have such great lecturers, but because you have community and you have connection. You're going to die. I'm going to die. We are finite. And that is the bad news. And my friends, that is the good news. Because the knowledge of that, the awareness of that, the secular willingness to accept Finitude creates in you the possibility of authentic relationships, a relationships that are so much more authentic than those that are built on myths and fairy tales and empty promises. You have the ability to build a certain kind of relationship that people need like they need water, that people need like they need food. So yeah, I want you to reflect on death today. I want you to think about what it means to vicariously enjoy other people's lives. I want you to think about what it means to proactively connect with people and enter into their lives. For the sake of? For the sake of making the most of the greatest gift from nowhere you will ever receive. Thanks so much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. Oh, yeah, you want me to take questions? I figured I, I rambled on so long that you'd probably be sick of me by now. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. If, you know how sometimes you feel guilty getting up and leaving, right, in the middle? Like, if you need to go, get out of here. We don't want you. We're sicky anyway. No, if you need to go, don't feel at all guilty about getting up and leaving. But if you've got a couple of questions, if anybody has a thought, I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to entertain a question. What do you got? So they got no questions, so we're done. Oh, you got one. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> she just said thank you. Don't make her get up. <laughs> yeah, what do you got? Uh, you were talking about your father and how he accepted your uh, secularism. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I was just wondering, uh, why do you think he did that? How, how do you think he can do that? And do you think it affects his ministry? You got the question? He's like, how does your dad accept that? How does he handle that? And, and, and how does that work? I'll tell you there are two things that are really important. The one thing is, is that my father is not the kind of Christian. And did any of you grow up Christian? Anybody like me? All right, bless your hearts. Um, I didn't leave Christianity all at once. I passed through every stage of heresy on my way out. I became the kind of Christian that married gay people, and then I became a universalist who believed that everybody's going to heaven no matter what they believe. And then I stopped believing in the sovereignty of God over events because I was living in the inner city. I saw too many terrible things happen. I mean, I, I worked my way out slowly, right? Because I had a lot to lose, by the way. It was not only my identity, it was also my paycheck. Um, have you ever heard Upton Sinclair quote, it's very difficult to convince a man to change his mind about something if his salary depends upon him not changing it? My friends, you need to be a lot, a lot more patient with some of your Christian friends because they have a lot at stake in that world. They have marriages at stake. They have, they have communities at stake. They have families at stake. So for me, I passed through all those stages, and my dad's faith has changed over, over the years. And one of the most important changes was is that my dad ceased to believe that God condemned people to everlasting damnation for having the wrong theology. Now, that's very important. Because there are two kinds of Christians. There are those that look at you and say, you don't believe what I believe, and that's a shame. You're missing out on some really fun hymns. <laughs> and then there are people that say, you don't believe what I believe, that's a sin, and you're gonna burn in hell for it. It's very difficult for the second kind to have a close relationship. With, I, partly because of them, I mean, they'll have a close relationship with you, they'll just, they'll just be evangelizing you all the time. But it's very difficult for me to be in the presence of somebody who thinks that I am worthy of damnation. That, I mean, the, the Christian doctrine of original sin is the, one of the most horrible doctrines that's ever come down the pike. It basically teaches that purely by virtue of being born, you are deserving of everlasting torture. That's how bad you are. And in fact, if you do go to heaven and if you do get to live with Jesus, it's not because you are valuable or worthwhile or in any way lovable, it's because of what? The grace of God. Grace, what a horrible doctrine. Right? It sounds really nice. God loves you no matter what you do. But what it really means is you're a piece of shit. I mean, that's what the Bible says. It says you're filthy rags. So if, if when a Christian believes in that, one of the things is I don't get in any other arguments with a Christian. When they say to me, I, I say to them, so my question is, if I don't end up agreeing with you, do you really believe that if I... If I don't accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, that I'm going to burn in everlasting damnation. And if they say yes, what I tend to say is I say like, hey, respectfully, it's really hard to have a meaningful conversation with somebody when they've told you that they think you are worthless. And so like, you just need to understand the implications of what you're saying to me. What you're telling me is that I have no value. And, and it's just hard to, hard to move forward. My dad... He's, just, he's not that way. So, so, so the heaven and hell thing is one thing that makes it a little bit easier. When I left the faith, my, my dad, one of the big emotions he had was embarrassment. You know what I mean? Like here you are, a famous evangelical minister. And, and, and it's funny because some of his friends blame him and say, wow, you must have really gone wrong. I'm thinking, dude, I was 30 years an evangelical preacher. I led thousands of people to Jesus Christ. And they're going to blame my father? But that's what we do. That's what people do to people. That's what people do to people. And so it's been really hard for my dad. And my dad is really honest. He's like, it's a very painful thing on the one hand. But on the other hand, he says, hey, I, I tried to raise a kid who would think for himself, who would have integrity, who would say what he really thought. He said, how, how can I be unhappy with that? And he said, the main thing is, is I, raised, I wanted to raise a kid who believed that loving other people was the best and most sensible way of life because Jesus said so. And he said, I got part of that. He said, you believe that loving other people is the best and most sensible way of life. And I do, and I go like, yeah. And I've got a lot of data to back it up. Go. How long will you burn the next seven generations? Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's when I, I get a lot of emails now from people who are, who, are, who are very, very upset with me because they feel like I'm leading young people 
down the road to damnation. Now, and, and, and I want you to understand my ministry. And yes, I call it a ministry at the University of Southern California. You say, how dare you use that word? Hey, you know what? In, in England, they have a ministry of agriculture. <laughs> and those are the people that try to address all the agricultural needs of Brit British people, right? Ministry is when you try to address somebody else's needs. The question is, on my college campus, there are a lot of young people that need perspective, that need fellowship, that need direction. And the answer is absolutely. And I try to do it. And my ministry at USC, I spend absolutely zero time trying to talk Christian kids out of believing in God. If that's working for them, and that's their family and stuff like that, I, I know all too well the cost of, of, of stepping out of that community. I, I don't try to pluck that, pluck that fruit until it's ripe, man. I let that happen. But half the campus doesn't believe in God, but that doesn't mean they're humanists. That doesn't mean they're committed to loving relationships. Half of them are committed to materialism. Half of them are committed to self-aggrandizement. And, and I know, because I studied the data, that those kids are going to have horrible lives, that they're going to end up dying unhappy, alone, miserable. Man, that the world, we can't afford to have more kids out there who, who, are, who don't believe in God, but also don't believe in life. My job is to take the kids that already don't believe in God and convince them that there's a better way of life and that it's all about building relationships and doing work that makes the world better for other people and cultivating a sense of wonder and gratitude for life. That's why these science talks are so great. You end up going like, oh my gosh, the neurons and the evolution of my hand and the eyes that see it and all this, this is incredible. And you go like, so what's the point of that? The point is, is that the more amazed you are by life, the more you will enjoy this life. And the more you enjoy this life, the more you will love other people. And the more you love other people, the better it is for our species. And I gotta tell you something, when I say I'm a humanist, it doesn't mean I don't love all the other animals. It just means that I'm most loyal to us, right? I'm looking out for our tribe. I'm looking out for our tribe. And the best way to look out for our tribe is to take young people and turn them on to a way of life that is better than the shitty materialism that they're getting sold at most modern universities. All right. Very good. Mark, Mark, a, a point of curiosity. Would you care to share some of the details how it was that your father influenced Clinton? No, it's not, it's, I'm not, I didn't come here to talk about my dad. Oh, OK. <laughs> no, no, I mean, the bottom line is my, my dad's a kind of, my, my, when, Clinton, when Clinton was in office, as maybe you might remember, he got in a little bit of trouble. And when he got in trouble, he had to cover himself, right? So he called in some ministers. And my dad was one of the ministers he called in because my dad was very well known for being a generous soul and a fun guy and a thoughtful person. And, um, and they connected really strongly because Clinton didn't grow up with a dad. And my dad grew up with a dad who was an immigrant who didn't speak any English and died when he was very young. And that creates a certain kind of insecurity in certain kinds of young men. And they were both, and you say, what, what, you're not telling me Bill Clinton's insecure. Oh, come on. <laughs> Anybody that needs to get a standing ovation every five minutes, who needs that kind of validation, right? You say, well, if he's insecure, then what about, don't, don't even get me started. <laughs> and so they bonded. They bonded, okay? And, and they remain they've remained very, very good friends. And when I, when I got written up in the New York Times, as a secular humanist chaplain at USC, Clinton called my dad and said, Tony, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you had one, some, some, yeah, go, 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 go. Since we brought up politics, and you've been in with one of the reasons we have this uh, current president, do you have any idea of how we can deal with these people that think we're going to hell when they're actually taking us there? <laughs> I will, t like, not to sell, not to sell my book <laughs> for 1995. Um, I, yeah, and I, I honestly, I, I didn't know you'd be this rich, so I, I only brought five copies because I didn't think, no, because most of the groups I go, they ain't got no money, and so they can't afford them anyway. So, uh, no, but the book is on sale. You, you can get it on Amazon. It's easy to get. The book is all about me and my dad having this conversation about how do, how do we work together? How, how do we connect? How do we understand each other? How do we ask honest questions? But if you say to me, how do we deal with these people? And I know what you mean by these people. My most important insight would be that you always have to look past a person's 
jerkiness, to see their fear. Every, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be an asshole, right? Nobody does. Something happens, right? So, right like if you, if, as a secularist, you, you, you need to know that like, you know, we are affected by our, our genetics. We are affected by our circumstance. We are affected by, so, so what happens is, is that there's a whole set of factors that lead a person to be that way and to think that way. And if you don't do the math and, and, and understand where that's coming from, you're going to be in trouble. Jonathan Haidt wrote a, wrote a really wonderful book called The Righteous Mind. Um, and it's about why good people disagree about religion and politics. It's a, it's a, he's, a, he's a social scientist. It's a fabulous book. It would be your book. And what he says is, he says that we're all motivated our, in, our moral, in our moral centers. We're all motivated. We, we think that we are rational people, but we are not rational people. We don't make our decisions in our reasons. We make them in our guts. And then we use our reasons to do what? Justify. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's really important to know. That's really important to know. People say to me, I don't like you. You know, I, I go to a lot of secular groups. They go, I don't like you. You tell stories. You were playing on our emotions and all that stuff. And you're like, yeah, because I'm rational. If I want to motivate people, I don't talk to them using st statistics and facts and figures because that's not how people make decisions. People make decisions in their guts. If you're rational, I mean, like, if you're rational, you don't speak to people's reasons. You speak to their emotions. Donald Trump knows that. And my sister, you need to speak to people's emotions. And there are two things you have to do. The first thing is, is that instead of arguing for the rationality of your position, you need to be able to give testimony to the goodness of your community. Does that make sense? That in some sense, what people want to know is, you know, what, what people want to know is, does this way of thinking, does this way of life that you've cultivated, does it actually translate into a better life. I mean, I was an evangelist for years. Do you think I evangelized people by convincing them that Christianity was rational? <laughs> no, what I did was I said to them, here's a wonderful way of life, and here's a community that you can enter into, and we're all going to love each other, and we're all going to make a difference in the world. Want to join? And kids were like, yeah, I want to join. And then they would say, crap, what do I got to believe to get in there? <laughs> and they were so hungry for it that they would believe that people can fly that they would believe that people can rise up from the dead after being dead for three days. They would believe anything to be a part of that community. You say, how does it work now? Oh, it's the same thing. I get a bunch of kids together. We build a community of people that love each other and are committed to the outside world. And then I say to people, hey, you want to join this community? They go, yeah, I want to be a part of that joint community. What do I have to believe to get in? And I go, nothing. <laughs> uh, my group is the fastest growing group on the USC campus. Because what draws people in is the emotional resonance that they feel. I mean, one of the problems with groups like this one, I mean, you, you, I don't know if you're wondering why you can't attract young people. Yeah. Do you ever wonder that? Yeah. Because you think you're going to attract them with lectures. <laughs> you say, how do you attract them? Oh, we have a potluck dinner every Sunday. My wife and I cook a big, huge meal, and we have them come, and we play games together, and I put little questions out on the table to spark conversation. I walked in here, nobody was talking to anybody. I'm, I'm dead serious. Nobody's talking to anybody in here, right? You know what I would do? I would have questions up on the board. Um, what was the funniest thing that happened to you this week? Um, you know, uh, I would have a question like, who was your favorite cartoon character when you were 10 years old? And I would just, and, I, and every time when people walk in, I would go like, let's just be talking to each other. Because what happens is kids walk into my group and they go like, oh, this is great. I, I, I want to be around these people. There's energy here. There's something here. See, what draws people in is fellowship. What draws people in is connection. What draws people in is a sense of shared mission. And so, and so what I'm saying to you is, you say, how do I talk to those people? And the answer is, you have to be able to talk from an emotionally resonant center. If you try to reason with them, they're not, that, that's, not where they're, that's not where they're at. So you've got to talk to them from a sense of reason. So if you said to them, hey, the guy today was really great. He talked about germatic cells and somatic cells. Snooze. <laughs> But if you say, hey, the guy today, you know what he talked about was? He talked about how we face up to the reality of death. And you know what? I, I'm really trying to grow in that area. You know what? I'm trying to grow in the area of trying to learn how to take more pleasure in other people's happiness. And my, some friends of mine and I, we're going to get together and have, we're going to get together over beers and we're going to talk about how we can share our lives more with, with each other and, and share our, our, our struggles with each other more so that we can, you know, support each other that way. 
Your Christian friend, your Trumpian supporter will go like, wow, now I want to listen to you. People, what, those people voted for Trump because he promised that he would fix their lives. And what that tells you is not, not so much that they're stupid, but that they're desperate. And so, my friends, what's your plan for fixing people's lives? Because until you offer to help fix people's lives and help them find more meaning and more love and more connection, you are not going to draw them in. Does that make sense? Okay. Groovy. Yo. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, wait, wait just a sec. Let, let me give you a mic. I have a friend, well, sort of a friend. She was my best friend all through high school. She was my only friend through high school. And um, we're still in touch, but she is a Jesus born again kind of person. Yeah, yeah. She's not a lecturer. She doesn't lecture me, but she worries about me. She worries about my soul. <laughs> and she sends me things to try to help me believe. Um, and... I have a hard time being honest with her because she worries about me. And um, she's a wonderful person. She does wonderful things for other people. She was there for my mom when she was dying, when my mom needed a believer to be with her. And I couldn't believe. Um, I don't know what to say to this woman. I mean, I kind of avoid, I've known her since I was 14 years right, old. Right, but you avoid meaningful I, conversation. Huh? Yeah, you, you, avoid mean, you avoid conversations that are going to go there. Yeah. I just sort of pretend that she's, you know, yeah, you're sending me this stuff and I'm reading it and so far I'm not convinced, but I'm willing to read it. And she generally worries about my soul. Okay, so, so first of all, I'm going to tell you, like, and again, this is not a plug, um, but my podcast, one of the things we talk about, like, every four weeks is how you engage in those, because most of the people that listen to me are post Christians and they've got all these. Christian people that they have to deal with. And so we have a lot of conversation about that. So I've had some really good people on there talking about that conversation. But shortly, here's what I'll tell you. The simplest rule I can give you is when somebody's worried about you, you want to acknowledge that worry. You want to acknowledge it and go like, wow, it must be so hard for you. If I believed, I mean, I know what you believe. If I believed what you believed, I would worry about me too. And so I want you to know that I understand and I appreciate it. I appreciate it. People tell me they're going to pray for me. I say, thank you. Yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. I, I appreciate it. That's the first thing. Second thing is this, is that if there's one rule of thumb I can give you for dealing with these people, it's do not tell them what you don't believe. Tell them what you are committed to. So a lot of, like, when, when, I talk, when I talk to somebody, the first thing I'll say to them is, like, I go, like, you know what? I'm pretty convinced that this life is the only one that I have. I'm pretty convinced of that. And so my, my earnest desire is to figure out how to make the most of it. And, you know, if I thought that using lots of drugs and having sex with every woman I could find would, would do it, I would go there. But I've done, the, I've done the research, and people that use lots of drugs and have sex with every woman or every man, that does not get... If I thought material wealth would do it, but like I've, I've seen, you get billions, they don't, those people don't end up happiest. You know what? I've done, the people that end up the happiest are always the people that are committed to loving relationships and are committed to making the world better for other people and committed to cultivating a sense of wonder. So that's what I'm trying to do. You need to become as good at sharing your good news as she is at sharing hers. Not so that you can beat her, but so that she can rest easy, not thinking that you don't have a clue. She needs to know that like, you know what, I'm part of a community, and this is what we're pursuing, and this is what I'm excited about, and this, you know, what, you know what I would say to my dad? So I said, Dad, you know what? I said, these are the things, you know, let me tell you how grateful I am for the way you raised me in church. Because you know what I got out of church? I got a real commitment to social justice. And I got a real commitment to, to integrity and honesty. Like, this is where I learned those things. Now listen, you say, are you saying the church invented those things? Hell no. I'm just saying that's where I learned them. If I was in Afghanistan, I would have learned them at a mosque. Mm -hmm. Right? If I was in India, I would have learned them at a, at a Hindu temple. I happened to learn them in, in, in a Christian church. And I can say with unequivocally, I'm grateful that I learned those lessons. Now I can't 
Oh, that's the other. Here's the other thing. Never tell your friend you don't believe in God. It's mean. What you're saying is, is I see what you are and I reject you. I see what you, I think you're stupid. I don't believe in God. You do, I don't. Tell him, tell, the, tell her the truth. I can't believe in God. Can't is a beautiful word. Isn't that true? Can you believe in God? Like if, if I gave, if I said, I've got a million dollars, I'm going to put you on a lie detector test. All I need you to do is pass a lie detector test that you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and flew up in heaven. Could you pass the test? No, no matter how motivated you were, you what, what would happen? Because you don't choose what you believe. You believe what you believe. And you know what? If I put your friend on a lie detector test, guess what? I couldn't get her to believe that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. So it's not, it's not that you won't believe in God or that you don't believe in God. It's that you can't believe in God. And that's a beautiful thing to tell her. And so what you say to her is, it's not within my power to believe in God. It's only, my, it's only within my power to try to make the most of life as I understand it. If you want me to believe in God, there's only one person that you should talk to about that. And that's God himself. Because the Bible teaches that we're saved by grace through faith. And this, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. So if any of your Christian friends say, you need to, you need to get some faith and stuff like that, go like, listen, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> if you want me to have faith, that's the gift of God. Only God can give it. And so if, if I don't have faith, if I burn in hell, it's God's fault. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Right. Yeah, yeah I mean, these... And, and, the, and the thing, remember we were talking about there are some people that are... that think you're going to hell, and there's some people that just think you're, you're going to get enlightened when you die. If your friend thinks you're going to burn in hell, it's almost impossible for her not to worry. I mean, think about it. Right? How could she not worry about you? How could she not? I mean, if... if, if Bert, is that it? Bert, if I knew that there was a hit man in the parking lot. And the second you walk out of here, he was going to kill you. And you said, and, and I knew that for a fact. And I said, Bert, there's a hit man in the parking lot. He's going to kill you. And you said, you know what, Bart? I'm not sure there is. But I know he's out there. And, and, you go, and, and I go, but Bert, I'm worried about you. And, you. and if you said to me, hey, Bart, don't worry. He's out there. If you think God is out there ready to kill everybody who doesn't believe in him, First of all, it's, I don't know how you can sing those songs about how nice he is. <laughs> but I also don't know how you, can't, how you can stop worrying. And so you've got to acknowledge her worry and enter, and enter into it and tell her that you appreciate it. Go. Go. Uh, not very good extemporaneous. Just to let it out. Bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> do you feel, uh, is it possible in the distant future that humanity may reach a point of love as the base of life where we realize we are fallible and don't know all, leaving room once again for a life beyond our life as we know it. I believe the love part, like, but not really. I mean, if you study evolution, what you'll study is that we are, that uh, love, forgiveness, compassion, these things naturally select. That we as a species have survived not because we're faster or stronger, but because what? We're more cooperative, right? right? This, this is what, this is what, and so, and so I really believe that it's possible, not, not inevitable. Natural selection is not, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily get you the best outcome. It's, it's, so I believe it's possible that we'll become more loving and more kind. But if you said to me, like, does somehow that translate into some kind of, like, Afterlife, my understanding is as simple as this. I really believe that my consciousness is wrapped up in my brain. Remember that bike accident he told you about? Yeah, well, I'll tell you something. For a month after that bike accident, I couldn't think straight. I wasn't myself. I, I had a brain injury. And if you've ever known anybody with a brain injury, sometimes you recover and sometimes you don't. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you smash this part of my brain, I'll become a different person. If you cut this part of my brain, I won't want to have sex anymore. If you cut this part, I won't have any short-term memory. If you cut this other part, I'll lose my taste for food. Like, 
I am in my brain. I, my identity is here. And so when this physical matter and energy breaks down, I won't exist anymore. Now, here's the thing you say, well, that's so terrible. Well, the truth of the matter is, I don't know what it is. For 13 billion years, I didn't exist, and it didn't bother me at all. <laughs> and I'm pretty convinced that after I die, for 13 billion years at least, I won't exist. This life is my brief vacation from non-existence. And what I'm telling you is, is that rather than grasping crazily for more, for coming up with all, grasping crazily for more, it might make more sense to make the most of your vacation? That's a great question. And, and, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying that I have no evidence that there is any reason for me to think there's anything more than this life. I am a religious naturalist. I, I think this world and this life is all there is, and I'm totally devoted to it. Yeah. Hey, dude, okay, I'm looking at you. Like, it, are you guys really cool with time? Because, like, okay, because, like, some of you I see getting fidgety, and you just got to go. You can't, you can't be polite. Okay. I got you, and then, and then where's – I got you. Okay. Go. I, I just had a quick question. Uh, so, you know, you described your experience of going from, you know, theist to atheist or however you define yourself yeah, yeah. now. I, I see I, – my question is I see a lot of people that go to seminary, and then they become atheists later on. And then for every group of people that's like that, I also pe see people that go to the state university and they're secular and maybe they become theists later in life. And I was wondering if you could speak to when you were in seminary or wherever you went, you know, why you saw that or why you think that happens. Because, you know, I, I've been told by a lot of people that proof is different from persuasion. And, and what do you think happens in the minds of people when they're in that program of study or even in their career afterwards? that causes some people to stay down the same path, but other people like yourself to go in a completely different direction. You know, I mean, the stories, everybody's got a different story. But the question after you ask yourself is, why do people, you know, Alain Dubouton um, once said that the most boring question you can ask about any religion is whether it's true. <laughs> the real question is, how does it function in a person's life? What, what does it do? How does it operate? And I think the question you have to ask yourself is, what brings somebody into faith in the first place? Because, like, I wasn't reasoned into Christianity. I was loved in. I was brought into a community of young people that loved me, and I was excited, and I, I want to be part of this. And, man, I didn't believe in God for the first six months that I was in that youth group. I was praying every, mor every morning, please, God, please, God, show up in my life, because I wanted to believe. So what happened? Well, we went on a retreat. You ever been on a retreat? You're up there in the mountains, right? Saturday night, you haven't slept very much. Fire's going, everybody's singing kumbaya. Swaying in the music, there's candlelight. 300 kids singing, I love you, Lord. And I, and I felt something. I felt a trans, it was like a transcendent experience. I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself. And you say, oh, come on. You, you don't, I mean, I mean, you must be embarrassed by that. You, I mean, you used, to, you used to preach sermons about how, you know, you heard the voice of God or how you felt the Holy Spirit. No, I heard the voice of God. I felt the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe in transcendent experiences, my friends, you have not been to the right rock concert. <laughs> you haven't used the right drugs. You haven't had sex with the right partner. Like, if you, if, if, I'm, I'm dead serious. If you don't believe that there are these experiences in which, it's funny, I saw this guy reach over and pat his wife on the leg. Oh, yeah, I, I, I've had some transcendence here. <laughs> like, if you, what I'm talking about is these experiences where you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself, where you get swept up in the hole, where, where what a psychologist would say the zeitgeist takes over the room, there's, there's a collective spirit. Listen, that stuff is real. And I'll tell you what, if you're in a Christian retreat when it happens, it's Jesus. And if you're in a Muslim temple when it happens, it's Allah. And if you're a secular humanist when it happens, you go like, wow, that's an event in my brain. I wonder how that works. <laughs> See, we have different explanations for it. But what I'm telling you is, is that whatever narrative you're in, when you have that transcendent moment, it tends to validate it. Now, the question is, when you go off to the seminary and you start reading, does the, do all the inconsistencies in the Bible begin to undermine that? They do. So well, then why do some people stay and why do some people go? Oh, well, what happens is, is that some people on a weekly basis renew the transcendent experience. 
They just keep pushing that sucker down. They go and they sing some more songs, stuff like that. My dad would say that what happened to me was, the real problem with me was, I stopped going to church. And he said, when you stop going to church, it was all over for you. Because he said, church is what a sociologist, my dad's a sociologist, he said, he was what they would call a plausibility structure. And you say, wait, within a community, you can reinforce ideas? Absolutely. Absolutely. You say, so why are you building secular community at USC? Because I'll tell you what, I got an idea that, that I want, I got an idea. Now, it happens to be a very logical idea that the best way to li- that love is the best way of life. But I got to tell you something. You ever, t- how many of you agree that love is the best way of life? I'm just curious. Nice, beautiful. Rest you, I hate your guts. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, totally. Okay, now, how many of you agree that exercise is a really sensible thing to do? Okay. How many of you exercise every day? Okay. Eating healthy, calling, being nice to my mother. I'm just telling you, my, in my experience, I can, having a set of values and living up to them are two different things. And so what happens is, is you say, well, who does live up to the values? Most of the people that exercise, exercise with groups of other people. They're part of a gym. They have a trainer. They do, you say, what do you say? What I'm saying is, is that just because I believe this is the best thing to do doesn't mean I do it. I need to constantly be reinforced. And you say, wait a second, are you saying that these people buy into a, a, a religious way of thinking and then they just keep themselves in a situation where it's constantly being reinforced? Yeah, have you ever listened to radio shows? Yeah, of course. That you reinforce, you reinforce, you reinforce. And you, so what happens is, is a lot of times what happens when people go to seminary is, is that they may, they may step from one Christianity into a different Christianity but what happens is, is that as soon as they start to realize that it isn't the whole world around them, but that rather that they were in one culture and now they're in a different culture, they start to go like, oh my gosh, all these cultures are things people make up. And once you start, once you start to realize that like it's fungible. I mean, you know, by the time I left, the God I believed in when I left Christianity was the nicest God you could ever believe in. He agreed with everything I thought. <laughs> but I had changed God 15 times to get there. And you say, well, why did you leave Christianity? Well, after a while, it starts to dawn on you that if God keeps changing his mind at about the same rate that you do, maybe you're making him up. But that takes, that's, that's a process. So why people deconvert, sometimes it's because, sometimes it's because they, get, they get exposed to different ways of thinking, but most often it's because they get exposed to a different culture or a different fellowship or a different plausibility structure. And you say, well, then if that were true and you wanted people to like believe in rational stuff like global warming and, um, you know, democratic government and all all sorts of things, then you would need to create plausibility structures where you reinforce those ideas. Yeah, I'm going like, yeah, if you guys think that being right means that you're going to be persuasive, (laughs) you have not been paying attention. You need to be right and persuasive. Does that make sense? That's a crappy answer to your question, though, isn't it? Did, 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 I, did I touch you? <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I guess one, one of the other things I have a question about is, like, I mean, like with theology, for example, I see a lot of overlap between philosophy and theology. Sure. I'm sure you would agree. Yeah. And so what my question are there non-confessional, secular ways in which people could approach theology legitimately as an academic discipline in the same way that they could philosophy or the secular academic study of religion or other <coughs> subjects such that they could go to a state university and stay secular or this other person could, you know, I, I guess I'm just not understanding why some people are persuaded and maybe I need to understand psychology. Yeah, why people change their minds? What, why do some people change their minds? And Could I address that? Can. What happens in that that's, that's a great question. Well, uh, that's a whole other lecture. Okay. okay, but my brother, here's the thing I would tell you. You should make them have a lecture and find the right person to have, have somebody come in here to talk about why people change their minds. My Jonathan Haidt book would be a good book, a good, a good source book. Here's, and the reason you should do that is because if there's anything that you guys want to do, it's what? Change some people's minds. And if there's anything that you want to do that I want to do as I get older, it's I want to keep what? 
I want to keep changing my mind. I want to keep learning new things and being like, have you ever had somebody totally prove to you that you were wrong? Have you ever done that in the middle of an argument going like, oh my gosh, you're right. How does it feel? It's exhilarating. You go like, oh my gosh, I'm capable of growth. Changing your mind is that, that is a, by the way, and by the way, that is a purely secular joy. Spirit, religion, hyper, hyper supernatural people, every fact, every time they change their mind, it's a loss. But for you and I, changing our minds is the most wonderful thing in the world. So I think that's, I think that is the topic of an amazing session for you guys. Okay, listen. Um, one more. One more, one more, go. Yeah. Anyway, this guy's not even part of your group. He came here to hear me. He, he's, he's, a, he's an infiltrator. I'm a... I'm a plant, and it's been very difficult because I serve a community who couldn't be comfortable here. Now, I came from the Christian roots, and I want to first applaud you for I am totally consistent with this. The, uh, the purpose is to make the most of what we have here in this birth-to-death cycle. Whatever the source or meaning beyond, fine. The purpose is to do the best we can here for everyone. I serve a community who can't be comfortable here because they can't be heard. Back in the 70s, we created this label called the near-death experience. And for 40 years, we have studied it. We formed an organization in the 70s because people wanted to study it do research, get empirical data about it, and nobody would publish the information. So we formed the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And we've published a peer-reviewed academic journal once a quarter since 1978. And we're a real you know, minor, small glitch in this whole thing. But it's that pendulum between a religious you know, outlook and indoctrination and culture, which I grew up in and I had to deprogram. But there are no atheists after a near-death experience. See, there see, are yeah. not necessarily theists, right? but they're in a different Now, mindset. I want you to understand what he's talking about when he says near-death experience. You, I mean, we all heard about, right, the people that, like, I saw the light or I heard the voice or something. And happened. you don't have to be flatlined to have right. one. Because but the point you is, opened up transcendent. There are people that have these experiences, and, and, and what I would say is they, they, they typically fall into two categories afterwards. Or, or all of us, as well, we, okay. we talk about Let me speak with no, studies. But let me, let me just, let me just, Empirical. I just want to place you, because I don't think, these guys don't know you very well. Ever... Anybody here not believe in near-death experiences? No, we all do. We, we all know people that, that, some of us have had them. You almost died. I had a near-death experience when I, hit, when, I, when I crashed my bicycle. Some people come out of those near-death experiences with a profound sense that there's more. That there's I'm more to them. I'm talking empirical data. I'm a scientific, I had a, my career was in computers. Ones and zeros and binary truth tables, logic to the, you know, minus degree. We have the data that talks about if one story is an antidote, hundreds of story are, you know, data. And you can make up your own minds. And we have a neutrality clause, no party line on the interpretation of these experiences. We're not here to justify whatever interpretation people want to use, but we are here to provide education and support, and our group is support for people who've had these experiences because they have no place to share them, to provide a safe place for sharing these experiences. So we have the empirical data from the point of view of we have instrumented bodies that have total recall and information they could not have from a physical materialist point of view. And we have you know, the book I sent you. And so, they, so then they you're really... They have cases in, yeah, that right. say... So then you're into a classic, like, it's, like, and you guys, you're into a classic scientific debate where, you know, no. this, this is not the... This is not... It, it's that, not a debate. These are people who just have to share their experiences it is a without debate. judging. It is a debate because there are other scientists. There are people like Michael Shermer on the other side who say, I think those people are 
mistaken. And or, they haven't looked at the data. And so whenever a scientist tells me that the data absolutely proves their point, I'm nervous because I've seen scientists, I, I, I work at USC with quantum physicists, and they take the same data and they have different explanations and interpretations of it. And so it's not that I dismiss your data, and it's not even that I dismiss your interpretation. It's just I'm saying like, it's, it's one interpretation of that data. And, and I think that what happens is, is that a lot of times, and this is again my experience with my religious friends, is that what they'll often tell me is, but that we're not, it's, it's data, yes, but it's also my personal experience. Like, I know this is true because I have experienced it. And, and, and you say, how do you argue with somebody's personal experience? And the answer is what? Yeah. You can't. You can't. And I think it's really important to understand that. Now, if somebody says to me, on the basis of my personal experience or on the basis of my data, you should believe this. What I would say is, not that I won't, not that I don't, but rather what? Yeah. I can't. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and he and your friend would get along very well. Because after you're done saying, hey, I, just, I, I, like, I, I don't see it the way you do, they would say, it's because you haven't looked at it clearly enough. Because if you looked at it clearly enough, you could come to no other conclusion. And what I would just say is, is that you have to be very, very careful Whenever you say to another human being, you can come to no other conclusion. Because the empirical data would suggest, yes, I can. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. It's been really good being with you. Can I have, if you want to join us for lunch, feel free to do we'll, so. We'll be in lunch together. Uh, and if you, bartcampola.org is where you can find me online. I would, if you got more you want to talk about or if you want a suggestion of a book or something, please reach out to me. My podcast is there. Everything's there. Don't, don't hesitate to write to me. Everyone else does. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mike.